Introductory Note to Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Introductory Note. In this volume I present selections made from the Russian chapbook literature and from the works of various Russian and Polish collectors of folklore. Afanasiev, Urban, Wojcicki, Glinsky, etc. The chapbook tales, and many of those of Glinsky, are, there is little doubt, of foreign origin. But since Russia and Poland are the countries in which these tales have found their home, and since they have there been so adapted by the people as to incorporate the national customs and lore, they appear to me to belong properly to the present volume. C. J. T. End of introductory note. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter One of Folk Lore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tammy Merritt. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 1. The Poor Man and the Judge. Once upon a time, there were two brothers who lived upon a piece of ground. The one was rich, the other poor. One day the poor brother went to the rich one and asked him to lend him a horse, so that he might carry wood from the forest. The rich brother lent him the horse, and the poor man asked him also to let him have a collar for it. The rich man, however, got angry and would not let him have one. Then it occurred to the poor man that he could fasten the sledge to the horse's tail. Anyway, he went to the forest to get his wood and he got such a load that the horse could scarcely draw it. When he came home with it, he opened the gate, but he did not think of the board at the foot of the gate. The horse tumbling over it tore its tail out. The poor fellow took the horse back to the rich brother, but he, when he saw the horse had no tail, would not receive it, and went off to the judge, Gaimeka, to complain to him of the poor brother. The poor man saw that things looked bad for him, and that he would be sent for by the judge. He thought over the matter for a long time, and at last set off after his brother on foot. On their way, the two brothers had to pass over a bridge. The poor man, thinking that he should never return from the judge alive, jumped over it. It chanced that, just at that time, a man's son was driving his sick father to the bath, and was passing under the bridge. The poor man fell upon the old man and killed him. The son went off to the judge to complain of his father having been killed. The rich brother, when he came to the judge, laid his complaint before him, telling him that his brother had pulled out his horse's tail. Now the poor man had taken a stone and wrapped it in a cloth, and he stood with it in his hand behind his brother, intending to kill the judge if he did not decide in his favor. The judge thought the man had brought him a hundred roubles, for him in the cloth, so he ordered the rich man to give the horse to the poor man until the tail had grown again. Then came the son to complain to the judge of the poor man having slain his father. The poor man again took the stone wrapped in the cloth and showed it to the judge, who thought the man must have two hundred roubles to give him for deciding the case. So he ordered the son to take his place upon the bridge and the poor man to stand below. Then the son was to throw himself off the bridge on to the poor man and crush him to death. The poor brother went to the rich one to take the horse without a tail, as the judge had ordered, so that he might keep it till the tail grew. The rich man, however, was not willing to lose his horse, so he gave the poor man five roubles, three bushels of corn, and a milk goat, and so they settled the matter. Then the poor man went off to the sun and said, According to the judgment, you must stand on the bridge while I must stand underneath it, and then you must jump off and crush me to death. Then thought the son, who knows whether if I jump off the bridge, I may not instead of crushing him to death, kill myself? So he thought it would be best to come to an agreement with the poor man, and he gave him two hundred roubles, a horse, and five bushels of corn. After this, the judge Skameka 
sent his servant to the poor man to ask him for two hundred roubles. The poor man showed him the stone and said, If the judge had not decided for me, I should have killed him with it. When the servant came back to the judge and told him that, he crossed himself. Thank heaven, he said. I decided as he wished. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Davis. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 2 The Wind Rider. A magician was once upon a time much put out with a young countryman, and being in a great rage, he went to the man's hut and stuck a new sharp knife under the threshold. When he did so, he cursed the man, saying, "'May this fellow ride for seven years on the fleet storm wind, until he has gone all round the world!' Now when the peasant went into the meadows in order to carry the hay, there came suddenly a gust of wind. It quickly scattered the hay, and then seized the peasant. He endeavoured in vain to resist. In vain he sought to cling to the hedges and trees with his hands. Do what he would, the invisible power hurried him forwards. He flew on the wings of the wind like a wild pigeon, and his feet no more touched the ground. At length the sun set, and the poor fellow looked with hungry eyes upon the smoke which curled from the chimneys in his village. He could almost touch them with his feet. But he called and screamed in vain, and all his wailing and complaints were useless. No one heard his lamentation. No one saw his tears. So he went on for three months, and what with thirst and hunger he was dried up and almost a skeleton. He had gone over a good deal of ground by that time, but the wind most often carried him over his native village. He wept when he saw the hut in which dwelt his sweetheart. He could see her busied about the house. Sometimes she would bring out some dinner in a basket. Then he would stretch out his dried-up hands to her, and vainly call her name. His voice would die away, and the girl not hearing him would not look up. He fled on. The magician came to the door of his hut, and seeing the man, cried to him mockingly, "'You have to ride for seven years yet flying over this village. You shall go on suffering, and shall not die.' "'Oh, my father,' said the man, "'if I ever offended you, forgive me. "'Look, my lips are quite hard, "'my face, my hands, look at them. "'I am nothing but bone. "'Have pity upon me.' "'The magician muttered a few words, "'and the man stopped in his course. "'He stayed in one place, "'but did not yet stand on the ground. "'Well, you ask me to pity you,' said the magician, "'and what do you mean to give me "'if I put a stop to your torment?' "'All you wish,' said the peasant, and he clasped his hands and knelt down in the air. "'Will you give me your sweetheart?' asked the magician, "'so that I may have her for my wife. "'If you will give her up, you shall come to earth again.' The man thought for a moment and said to himself, "'If I once get on the earth again, "'I may see if I cannot do something.' So he said to the magician, "'Indeed, you ask me to make a great sacrifice, "'but if it must be so, it must.' The magician then blew at him, and the man came to the ground. He was very pleased to find the earth once more under his feet, and to have escaped from the power of the wind. Off he hurried to his hut, and at the threshold he met his sweetheart. She cried aloud with amazement when she saw the long-lost peasant, whom she had so long lamented and wept for. With his skinny hands the man put her gently aside, and went into the house, where he found the farmer who had employed him sitting down, and said to him, as he commenced to weep, "'I can no longer stay in your service, and I cannot marry your daughter. I love her very much, as much as the apple of my eye, but I cannot marry her.' The old farmer wondered to see him, and when he saw his white-pinched face and the traces of his suffering, he asked him why he did not wish for the hand of his daughter. The man told him all about his ride in the air, and the bargain he had made with the magician. When the farmer had listened to it all, he told the poor fellow to keep a good heart, and putting some money in his pocket, 
went out to consult a sorceress. Towards evening he returned very merry, and taking the peasant aside, said to him, "'Tomorrow morning, before day, go to the witch, and you will find all will be well.' The wearied peasant, who had not slept for three months, went to bed, but he woke before it was day, and went off to the witch. He found her sitting beside the hearth, boiling herbs over a fire. She told him to stand by her, and suddenly, although it was a calm day, such a storm of wind arose that the hut shook again. The sorceress took the peasant outside into the yard and told him to look up. He lifted his eyes and, oh wonder, saw the evil magician whirling round and round in the air. "'There is your enemy,' said the woman. "'He will trouble you no more. If you would like to see him at your wedding, I will tell you what to do, but he must suffer the torment that he meant to put you to.' The peasant was delighted and ran back to the house, and a month later he was married. While the wedding folk were dancing, the peasant went out into the yard, looked up, and saw right over the hut the magician turning round and round. Then the peasant took a new knife, and throwing it with all his force, stuck it in the magician's foot. He fell at once to the ground, and the knife held him to the earth, so that he could only stand at the window and see how merry the peasant and his friends were. The next day he had disappeared, but he was afterwards seen flying in the air over a lake. Before him and behind him were flocks of ravens and crows, and these, with their hoarse cries, heralded the wicked magician's endless ride on the wind. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 3 The Three Gifts. A very rich widow had three children. A stepson, a fine young fellow, a stepdaughter of wonderful beauty, and a daughter who was not so bad. The three children lived under the same roof and took their meals together. At length the time came when the children were treated very differently. Although the widow's daughter was bad-tempered, obstinate, vain, and a chatterer, her mother loved her passionately, praised her, and covered her with caresses she was favored in every way the stepson who was a good-natured lad and who did all kinds of work was forever grumbled at checked and treated like a sluggard as for the stepdaughter who was so wonderfully pretty and who had the disposition of an angel she was tormented worried and ill-treated in a thousand ways between her sister and her stepmother her life was made miserable it is natural that one should love one's own children better than those of other folk but it is only right that liking and disliking should be indulged in with moderation the evil stepmother however loved her child to distraction and equally detested her stepchildren to such a pitch did she carry these feelings that when she was angry she used to say how she would advance the fortune of her daughter even at the orphan's expense an old proverb says man sets the ball rolling but heaven directs it and we shall see what happened one sunday morning the stepdaughter before going to church went out into the garden to pluck some flowers to place on the altar she had gathered some roses when on lifting up her eyes she saw right in front of her three young men who sat upon a grassy bank they were clothed in garments of dazzling white, which shone like sunshine. Near by them was an old man, who came and asked the girl for alms. The girl was a little frightened when she saw the three men, but when the old man came to her, she took her last piece of money out of her pocket and gave it to him. The poor man thanked her, put the piece of money into his bag, and laying his hand on the girl's head, said to the young men, you see this little orphan she is good and patient and suffering and has so much pity for the poor that she gives them even the last penny she has what do you wish for her the first one said i wish that when she cries her tears may turn to pearls 
i wish said the second that when she laughs the most delicately perfumed roses may fall from her lips and i said the third wish that when she touches water golden fish spring up in it so shall it be said the old man and he and his companions vanished when the girl saw that she gave thanks to heaven and ran joyfully into the house hardly had she entered when her stepmother met her and gave her a slap on the face saying where are you running to the poor girl began to cry but behold instead of tears pearls fell from her eyes the stepmother forgot her rage and set herself to gather them up as quickly as possible the girl could not help laughing at the sight and from her lips there fell roses of such a delightful scent that the stepmother was beside herself with pleasure after that the girl wishing to preserve the flowers she had plucked in the garden poured some water into a glass as soon as she touched the water with her finger it was filled with beautiful golden fish from that time the same things never failed to happen the girl's tears turned to pearls when she laughed roses which did not die fell from her lips and water which she only touched with her little finger became filled with golden fish the stepmother became better disposed towards her and by little and little learned from her the secret of how she had obtained these gifts on the following sunday she sent her own daughter into the garden to pluck flowers as if for the altar hardly had the girl gathered some roses when lifting up her eyes she saw the three young men sitting on a grassy bank beautiful and shining like the sun and by them was the old man clad in white who asked her for alms when she saw the young men the girl pretended to be afraid but when the old man spoke to her and she ran to him took out of her pocket a gold piece looked hard at it then gave it to him but evidently very much against her will the old man put the money in his bag and said to the three others you see this girl who is her mother's spoilt child she is bad-tempered wicked and as hard-hearted as regards the poor we know very well why she has been so charitable for the first time in her life to-day tell me what you wish for her the first said i wish that when she cries her tears may change to lizards i said the second wish that when she laughs hideous toads may fall from her lips and i said the third wish that when she touches water with her hand it may be filled with serpents it shall be as you wish said the old man and he and his companions disappeared the girl was terrified and ran into the house to tell her mother what had happened all occurred as had been said when she laughed toads sprang from her lips when she cried her tears changed to lizards and when she touched water it became full of serpents the stepmother did not know what to do she paid greater attention than ever to her daughter and hated the orphans more and more and so tormented them that the lad not being able to put up with it took leave of his sister praying heaven to guard her and leaving his stepmother's house set out to seek his fortune the wide world was before him he knew not where to go but he knew that heaven that sees all men watches over all watches over the orphans he prayed and then walking down to the burial ground where slept his father and mother he knelt at the grave he wept and prayed for a time and having kissed the earth which covered them three times he rose and prepared to set out on his journey all of a sudden he felt in the folds of his dress on his bosom something he had not perceived there before he put his hand up and was so astonished that he could scarcely believe his eyes for he found there a charming little picture of his much-loved sister surrounded by pearls roses and little golden fish delighted at the sight he kissed the picture looked around the burial ground once more made the sign of the cross and set out on his way a story is soon told but events move slowly after many adventures of little importance 
he came to the capital of a kingdom situated on the seashore there he sought to obtain a living and he was not unsuccessful for he was engaged to look after the king's garden and was both well fed and well paid this good fortune did not however make him forget his poor sister about whom he was much troubled when he had a moment to himself he would sit down in some quiet spot and look at his picture sometimes melting into tears for he looked upon the portrait of his sister as a precious legacy given to him by his parents at their grave one day while the lad sat thus by a brook the king saw him and creeping up to him from behind very softly he looked over his shoulder at the likeness that the young man was regarding so attentively give me the portrait said the king the lad gave it to him the king looked at it and was delighted never said he in all my life did i see such a beautiful girl never have i heard of such a one never did i dream there was such tell me does she live the lad burst into tears and told the king that the picture was the portrait of his sister who some time ago had been so favored by heaven that when she cried her tears became pearls when she laughed roses sprang from her lips and when she touched water it was filled with golden fish the king ordered him to write at once to his stepmother to tell her to send her lovely stepdaughter to his palace where the king waited to make her his wife on the occasion of his marriage he declared he would heap rewards on the stepmother and on the brother of his bride the lad wrote the letter and the king sent a servant with it a story is quickly told but events move slowly after she had read the letter the stepmother did not show it to the orphan but to her own daughter so they plotted together and the stepmother went to an old sorceress to consult her and to be instructed in magic she then set out with her two daughters as they came near to the capital of the king's dominions in a place near to the sea the stepmother suddenly threw the stepdaughter out of the carriage muttered some magic words and spat three times behind her all at once the poor girl became very little covered with feathers and changed into a wild duck she commenced to cackle threw herself into the sea just as ducks do and began to swim about there the stepmother dismissed her with these words by the force of my hate i have done what i wished swim away upon the shore like a duck happy in liberty and in the meantime my daughter clothed in your beauty shall marry the king and enjoy all that was meant for you hardly had she finished these words when her daughter found herself clothed in all the charms of the unfortunate girl so they went on their way came to the palace which they reached at the time named in the letter and there the king received the daughter from the hands of the treacherous stepmother in place of the orphan after the marriage the stepmother loaded with presents returned to her home the king looking upon his wife could not imagine how it was that he did not feel that love and tenderness that had been so aroused in him at the sight of the portrait however there is no remedy what was done was done heaven sees one and knows of what malady one shall die and what woman one shall marry the king admired his wife's beauty and thought of the pleasure he would have when he saw the pearls drop from her eyes the roses from her lips and the golden fish spring up in the water she touched during the feast however the queen chanced to laugh at her husband and a mass of hideous toads sprang forth the king ran off quickly then the queen commenced to cry, and instead of pearls, lizards dropped from her eyes. An attendant presented a basin of water to her, but she had no sooner dipped the tip of her finger in the water than it became a mass of serpents, which began to hiss and dart into the middle of the wedding party. Everyone was afraid, and all was in confusion. The guards were at last called in, and by their aid the hall was cleared, of the horrible reptiles the king had gone into the garden where he met with the orphan lad 
and so enraged was the king at the trick that he thought had been played him that he gave the lad a blow on the head with his stick the poor lad falling down upon the ground died at once the queen came running to the king sobbing and taking him by the hand said what have you done you have killed my brother who was altogether guiltless is it his fault or mine that since i have been married to you i have lost the wonderful powers i once had they will come back again in time but time will not bring my brother to me more pardon me my dear wife said the king in a moment of rage i thought he had betrayed me and i wished to punish him i am sorry for what i have done now however it is beyond recall forgive me and i forgive you with all my heart i pardon you said the queen but i beg you to order that my brother shall be honourably buried the queen's wish was carried out the poor lad who was thought to be the queen's brother was put into a fine coffin and laid on a magnificent catalphic in the church when night came on a guard of honour was placed around the coffin and at the gates to watch till morning towards midnight the doors of the church opened of their own accord and without any noise and at the same moment an irresistible drowsiness came over the soldiers who all went to sleep a pretty little wild duck entered stopped in the middle of the church shook its feathers of which it freed itself one by one and there stood the orphan girl in her former shape she approached the coffin of her brother and shed very many tears over him which all changed to pearls after she had wept for some time she reassumed the feathers once more and went out when the guards awoke great was their surprise to find a number of beautiful pearls on the coffin the next day they told the king how the gates of the church had opened of themselves at midnight how an irresistible desire to sleep had overtaken them and how the pearls had been discovered upon the coffin the king was surprised at their story and more so when he saw the pearls he doubled the guard and told them to watch more carefully the second night at the same time the doors opened again of themselves and the soldiers again fell asleep the wild duck entered shook off its feathers and became the lovely girl at the sight of the double guard all of them fast asleep she could not help laughing and beautiful roses fell from her lips as she approached her brother her tears broke forth and fell in a shower of pearls to the ground at length she took her feathers again and flew away when the guards awoke they collected the roses and pearls and took them to the king who was now more surprised than before seeing not only the pearls but the roses also he again doubled the guards and he threatened them with the most severe punishment if they did not keep awake they did their best but all was of no use at the end of their nap at the end of their nap on the third night they found not only pearls and roses but also golden fish swimming in the church font the king was now very much astonished and began to think that there must be some magic in the matter when night came on again he doubled the number of the guards and he hid himself in the chapel after having put up a mirror in which he could see everything reflected without being himself seen at midnight the doors opened of themselves the soldiers dropped their arms lay down on the ground and fell fast asleep the king did not take his eyes off the mirror and he saw a little wild duck enter and looked timidly around it when it saw the guards all asleep it seemed to take courage and came into the middle of the church then it cast off its feathers and became a girl of extraordinary loveliness. the king was transported with joy and wonder and felt that this must be his true bride when she had come to the coffin the king rushed forward with a wax taper in his hand and set fire to the feathers the flame leaping up and waking the guards when the girl saw what was done she ran to the king wringing her hands while pearls dropped from her eyes 
what have you done she cried how shall i now escape the fury of my stepmother by whose magic arts i was turned into a wild duck then she told the king all and he at once ordered some of his guards to seize the woman who had so treacherously married him and to conduct her out of the kingdom he also sent some soldiers to take the stepmother and burn her as a sorceress while the king gave these orders the girl took from her bosom three little vessels which she had brought with her from the sea full of different liquids she sprinkled the liquid in one of them over her brother and he became supple and warm his cheeks took their color again and the warm red blood began to run from his wound his sister sprinkled him again with the second liquid which had the property of healing and his wound was at once closed she sprinkled him the third time with the water which had the property of calling back to life the young man opened his eyes looked on his sister with astonishment and threw himself full of happiness into her arms at the sight of this the king was overjoyed he took the young man by the hand and leading his sister the three went to the palace in a short time he married his true bride, and he lived happily with her and her brother for many years. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wolfgang Bass. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 4. Snigurka. There was once upon a time a peasant named Ivan, who had a wife named Marie. They had been married many years and loved one another, but they had no children, and this caused them so much sorrow that they could find no pleasure but in watching the children of their neighbors. What could they do? Heaven had will it so. Things in this world do not go as we wish, but as heaven ordains. One day in the winter the children played about in the road, and two old folk looked on, sitting in the window seat. At last the children began to make a beautiful snow figure. Ivan and Marie looked on, enjoying it. All of a sudden Ivan said, Wife, suppose we make a snow figure. Marie was ready. Why not? said she. We might as well amuse ourselves a little. But what is the use of making a big figure? Better make a snow child, since God has not given us a living one. You're right said Ivan, and he took his hat and went out into the garden with his wife. So they set to work to make a snow child. They fashioned a little body, little hands, and little feet. And when all that was done, they rolled a snowball and shaped it into a hat. Heaven bless you, cried a passerby. Thanks, replied Ivan. The help of heaven is always good, said Marie. What are you doing? asked the stranger. Look, said Ivan. We are making a snow girl, said Marie. On the ball of snow which stood for a hat, they made the nose and the chin. Then they put two little holes for the eyes. As Ivan finished the work, oh, wonderful, the figure became alive. He felt a warm breath come from its lips. Ivan drew back and looked. The child had sparkling eyes, and there was a smile upon its lips heavens what is this cried ivan making the sign of the cross the snow figure bent its head as if it was alive and stared its little arms and legs in the snow as if it was a real child ivan ivan cried marie trembling with joy heaven has heard our prayers and she threw herself on the child and covered her with kisses the snow fell away from the little girl like the shell from a chicken oh my dear snigurka cried marie embracing the long wished for an unexpected child and she carried her off into the cottage ivan had much to do to recover himself he was so surprised and marie was foolish with joy 
Snigurka grew hour by hour and became more and more beautiful. Ivan and Marie were overjoyed and their heart was full of life and merriment. The village girls were always there, playing with Snigurka, dressing her, chattering with her, singing songs to her, teaching her all they knew. Snigurka was very clever. She noticed everything and learned things so quickly. During that winter, she grew as big as a three-year-old child. She understood things, and when she spoke, her voice was so sweet that one could have listened to it forever. She was amiable, obedient, and affectionate. Her skin was white, and her hair was the color of flax, and her eyes deep blue. Her cheeks, however, had no rosy flush in them, for she had no blood. But she was so good and so amiable that everyone loved her. You see, said Mary, what joy has heaven given us in our old age? Heaven be thanked, responded Ivan. At last the winter was ended, and the spring sun shone down and warmed the earth. The snow melted, the green grass sprang up in the fields, and the lark sang high up in the sky. The village girls went singing, Sweet spring, how did you come to us? How did you come? Did you come on a plow or on a harrow? Snigurka, however, became very sad. What is the matter with you, my dear child? said Marie, drawing her to her and caressing her. Are you not well? You are not merry. Has an evil eye glanced on you? No, answered Snigurka. It is nothing, mother. I am quite well. The last snow of the winter had melted and disappeared. Flowers sprang up in all the gardens and fields. In the woods, the nightingale and all the birds sang, and all the world seemed very happy, save Snigurka, who became more and more sad. She would run away from her companions and hide herself from the sun in the dark nooks like a timid flower under the trees. She liked nothing save playing by the waterside under the green willows. She seemed to enjoy only the cool and the shower. At night time she was happy, and when a good storm occurred, a fierce hailstorm, she was as pleased with the drops as if they had been pearls. When the sun broke forth again, when the hail was melting, then Snigurka began to weep bitterly. The spring was ended, the summer came, and the feast of St. John was at hand. The girls were going to play in the woods, and they called for Snigurka to go with them. Marie was afraid to let her go, but she thought that the outing might do her child good. So she got her ready, embraced her, and said, Go, my child, and play with your friends. And you, my daughters, look well after her. You know, I love her better than the apple of my eye. All right, cried they all, and they ran off in the body of the woods. There they plucked wild flowers, made themselves rest, and sang songs. When the sun was setting, they made a fire of dry grass and placed themselves in a row by it, each of them having a crown of flowers on her head. Look at us, said they to Snigurka, how we run and follow us. And then they began to sing and to jump around and over the little fire. All of a sudden they heard behind them a sigh. Ah. They looked about them, and then at one another there was nothing to be seen. They looked again and found that Snigurka was no longer among them. She has hidden herself, cried they. Then they looked for her and could not find her, calling out and shouting her name, but there was no answer. Where can she be? She must have gone home, said they. They ran back to the village, but there no one had seen Snigurka. All the folk searched during the next day and the day following. They went through all the woods, they looked through every thicket, but no trace of the child was discovered. Ivan and Marie were inconsolable, and for a long time did the poor mother seek her child in the woods, crying, Snigurka, my sweet, come to me. Sometimes she thought she could hear the voice of her child replying to her, but no, it was not Snigurka. What could have become of her? Falk asked one another. 
can a wild beast have carried her off into the woods has some bird of prey flown off with her no beast had carried her off nor had a bird flown away with her when she began to run with her companions she suddenly changed into a light vapor and was carried up to heaven end of chapter four chapter five of folklore and legends russian and polish this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by elizabeth davis folklore and legends russian and polish by charles john tibbets chapter five prince peter and princess magdalene in the kingdom of france there was once a high-born prince named folkvan who married a noble lady named petronita they had one son who was called peter this prince peter in his youth was very fond of horsemanship and of war and when he grew up he thought of nothing but knightly deeds now it chanced that just at that time there arrived a knight named rugandwis who had come from naples and he seeing the prince's disposition said to him prince peter the king of naples has a beautiful daughter named magdalene and he bestows great rewards on the knights who by their deeds do honor to her peter when he heard that went to his father and mother and begged them to let him go to naples to learn knightly arts and especially to see the beautiful magdalene the daughter of the king they parted with prince peter with great sorrow and bade him only make friends of good folk then they gave him three gold rings with precious stones and also a golden key so they sent him off when prince peter came to naples he went to a clever workman and ordered him to make him a coat of mail and a helmet to match and told him to fasten it to two golden keys when he had done this he rode away to the place where the tournaments were held where he found the king the folk called peter peter with the golden keys and off he went and placed himself among the knights first of all there rode out the knight andre scrintor and against him appeared the son of the king of england andre dealt henry such a blow that he was nearly thrown off his horse then landiot the king's son came forth and threw andre off his horse on to the ground when prince peter saw that landiot had thrown andre from his saddle he rode out and cried aloud long may their majesties live in happiness the king the queen and their beautiful daughter the princess magdalene he rode at landiot with such force that his horse rolled on the ground and the spear went through his heart this deed won for him the praise of the king and of all the knights but especially that of the princess magdalene and prince peter became the first of all the king's knights now when the beautiful princess saw how brave and handsome prince peter was she fell in love with him and resolved to marry him she made a confidant of her maid and from that time prince peter used to see the princess daily he gave her the three golden rings as a mark of his true love and one day taking her with him rode away from the city they rode off on their good horse taking much gold and silver with them and they continued their journey all night at length they came to a thick forest which stretched far away to the seashore there they stopped to rest and the princess lying down on the grass fell fast asleep prince peter sat by her side and watched her and as he looked at her he saw a locket having a golden fastening he opened it and out fell the three gold rings he had given to her the prince put them on the grass and as it chanced a black raven flew by at the moment seized the rings and took them off into a tree peter climbed up the tree hoping to catch the bird but as he was about to seize it the raven flew into another tree and so from tree to tree till at last it went away over the sea to an island letting the rings fall into the water prince peter followed the bird and having come to the seashore he looked about him for a boat in which he could pursue it to the island at length he set off in a small fishing boat but as he had no oars he paddled along with his hands all of a sudden as he was on his way there came a storm of wind which carried him away to the open sea when the prince saw he was far from the shore he thought he was lost and he prayed with groans and tears alas 
"'I am the most miserable and unfortunate of all men,' said he. "'Why did I not leave the rings in the locket where they were safe? "'No one in the world is so unfortunate as I, for I have lost my happiness. "'I have led the princess away, and have left her in the thick forest "'where wild beasts will tear her in pieces, "'or she will wander about till she dies of hunger. "'I am her destroyer, and have spilt innocent blood.' He then began to sink in the sea. As it chanced, a vessel came by, bound from Turkey, and when the sailors saw a man floating on the sea, they took him on board, and carrying him away to Alexandria, they sold him to a Turkish pasha, who sent him off as a present to the sultan. When the sultan saw how good his behavior was, and how agreeable he was, he made him one of his counsellors, and his honesty and his good nature won him the love of all who came in contact with him. When the princess awoke, she found herself in the thick forest. She looked on every side, and when she could not see Prince Peter, she was much distressed, and sank down upon the ground. Then she went into the wood, and called with all her strength, "'My dear husband! Prince Peter! Where are you?' She wandered on a long way until she met a nun, with whom she exchanged clothes, putting on the nun's dark garments, and giving her her own light-coloured dress." Then she went on to a port, where she went on board a vessel which was about to sail to the country over which Prince Peter's father ruled. When she came there, she went to live with a noble lady named Susanna, and finding a place among the mountains, she made a harbor, built a convent there, named after the apostles Peter and Paul, and there she also founded a hospital for strangers. So she became famous for her pious works. One day the father and mother of Prince Peter came to her, and brought to her three rings. They told her that their cook had purchased a fish in which the rings had been found. These rings they had given to their son Peter, and they therefore concluded that he had been drowned, and they wept bitterly. Now when Peter had been with the Sultan a long time, he wished to visit his own land, and the Sultan gave him his leave to go, loading him at the same time with presents of gold, silver, and magnificent pearls. Having taken leave of the Sultan, the Prince went and hired a French vessel, bought fourteen casks, put salt at the bottom of them, laid the gold and silver in the casks, scattered more salt on the top of the treasure, and told the sailors there was nothing but salt in the casks. The wind was favorable, and they set off for the prince's land, and having arrived at an island not far off the coast of France, they weighed anchor, for the prince was very seasick. He went upon shore and wandered about in the island till he lost his way, and being tired he lay down and went to sleep. He slept a long time, and the sailors sought him and called him everywhere, but as they could not find him, they set sail. They came to the princess's convent, where they sold the salt. Now one day, when salt was wanted, Magdalene went to the casks, and was very much surprised to find in them all the treasure. Prince Peter was picked up by another vessel, and came likewise to the convent. There he was in Magdalene's hospital for a month, but all that time he did not recognize the princess for her black veil hid her features from him. While he was there, he wept every day. One day, as Magdalene came into the hospital, she saw the prince weeping, and she asked him why he did so, and he told her all his misfortunes. Magdalene then recognized him, and sent off to his father and mother to tell them that their son was come back. When they came to the convent, they found the princess arrayed in her royal garments, and when the prince saw his parents, he fell at their feet, embraced them, and wept, while they wept with him. At length he stood up, and taking them by the hand, kissed them, and said, My father and mother, this lady is the daughter of the great king of Naples, on account of whom I left you. So they were married, and they lived in great happiness. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Casper. www.philcasper.net. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish, by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter Six The Old Man, His Wife, and the fish there once lived in a hut on the shores of the isle of buyan an old man and his wife 
they were very poor. The old man used to go to the sea daily to fish, and they only just managed to live on what he caught. One day he let down his net and drew it in. It seemed to be very heavy. He dragged and dragged, and at last got it to shore. There he found he had caught one little fish of a kind he had never seen before. A golden fish. The fish spoke to him in a man's voice. Do not keep me, old man, it said. Let me go once more free in the sea, and I will reward you for it. For whatever you wish, I will do. The old man thought for a while. Then he said, Well, I don't want you. Go into the sea again. And he threw the fish into the water and went home. Well, said his wife when he got home, what have you caught today? Only one little fish, said the man, a golden fish, and that I let go again. It begged so hard. Put me in the blue sea again, it said, and I will reward you for whatever you wish I will do. So I let it go and did not ask anything. Ah, you old fool, said the wife in a great rage. What an opportunity you have lost. You might at least have asked the fish to give us some bread. We have scarce a crust in the house. The old woman grumbled so much that her husband could have no quiet. So to please her, off he went to the seashore, and there he cried out, Little fish, little fish, come now to me. Your tail in the water, your head out of sea. The fish came to the shore. Well, what do you want, old man? It asked. My wife, said the man, is in a great passion and has sent me to ask for bread. Very well, said the fish. Go home and you shall have it. The old man went back, and when he entered the hut, he found bread in plenty. Well, said he to his wife, we have enough bread now. Oh, yes, said she, but I have had such a misfortune while you were away. I have broken the bucket. What shall I do the washing in now? Go to the fish and ask it to give us a new bucket. Away went the man. Standing on the shore, he called out, Little fish, little fish, come now to me. Your tail in the water, your head out of sea. The fish soon made its appearance. Well, old man, it said, what do you want? My wife, said the man, has had a misfortune and has broken our bucket. So I have come to ask for a new one. Very well, said the fish. You shall find one at home. The old man went back. As soon as he got home, his wife said to him, be off to the golden fish again, and ask it to give us a new hut. Ours is all coming to pieces. We have scarcely a roof over our heads. The old man once more came to the shore and cried, Little fish, little fish, come now to me, your tail in the water, your head out of sea. The fish came. Well, what is it? asked the fish. My wife, said the man, is in a very bad temper and has sent me to ask you to build us a new cottage. She says she cannot live any longer in our present one. Oh, do not be troubled about that, said the fish. Go home. You shall have what you want. The old man went back again, and in the place of his miserable hovel he found a new hut, built of oak and nicely ornamented. The old man was delighted, but as soon as he went in, his wife said on him, saying, What an idiot you are! You do not know how to take good fortune when it is offered to you. You think you have done a great thing just because you have got a new hut? Be off again to the golden fish and tell it I will not be a mere peasant's wife any longer. I will be an archduchess with plenty of servants and set the fashion. The old man went back to the golden fish. What is it? asked the fish. My wife will not let me rest, replied the man. She wants now to be an archduchess, and is not content with being my wife. Well, it shall be as she wishes. Go home again, said the fish. Away went the man. How astonished was he when, on coming to where his house had stood, he now found a fine mansion, three stories high. Servants crowded the hall, and cooks were busy in the kitchens. On a seat in a fine room sat the man's wife, dressed in robes shining with gold and silver, and giving orders. Good day, wife, said the man. Who are you, man, said his wife. What have you to do with me, a fine lady? Take the clown away, said she to her servants. Take him to the stable and whip some of the impudence out of him. The servants seized the old man, took him off to the stable, and when they had him there, beat him so that he hardly knew whether he was alive or not. After that, the wife made him the doorkeeper of the house. She gave him a besom, 
and put him to keep the yard in order. As for his meals, he got them in the kitchen. He had a hard life of it. If the yard was not swept clean, he had to look out. Who would have thought she had been such a hag, said the old man to himself. Here she has all such good fortune and will not even own me for her husband. After a time, the wife got tired of being merely an archduchess. So she said to her husband, Go off to the golden fish and tell it I will be a Tsarina. The old man went down to the shore. He cried, Little fish, little fish, come now to me. Your tail in the water, your head out of sea. The fish came swimming to the shore. Well, old man, it said, what do you want? My wife is not yet satisfied, said the man. She wants now to be a Tsarina. Do not let that trouble you, said the fish. But go to your house. What you ask shall be done. The man went back. In place of the fine house, he found a palace with a roof of gold. Soldiers were on guard around it. In front of the palace was a garden, and at the back a fine park in which some troops were parading. On a balcony stood the Tsarina, surrounded by officers and nobles. The troops presented arms, the drums beat, the trumpets blew, and the people shouted. In a short time the woman got tired of being Tsarina, and she commanded that her husband should be found and brought to her presence. The palace was all in confusion, for who knew what had become of the old man? Officers and noblemen hurried here and there to search for him. At length he was found in a hut behind the palace. "'Listen, you old idiot!' said his wife. "'Go to the golden fish and tell it I am tired of being Tsarina. I want to rule over all the ocean, to have dominion over every sea and all the fish.' The old man hesitated to go to the fish with such a request. "'Be off!' said his wife or your head shall be cut off. The man went to the seashore and said, Little fish, little fish, come now to me. Your tail in the water, your head out of sea. The fish did not come. The man waited, but it was not to be seen. Then he said the words a second time. The waves roared. A short while before, it had been bright and calm. Now dark clouds covered the sky. The wind howled and the water seemed of an inky blackness. At length the fish came. "'What do you want, old man?' it asked. "'My old wife,' answered he, "'is not satisfied even now. She says she will be Tsarina no longer, but will rule over all the waters and all the fish.' The fish made no reply, but dived down and disappeared in the sea. The man went back. What had become of the palace? He looked around, but could not see it. He rubbed his eyes in wonder. On the spot where the palace had stood was an old hut, and at the door stood the old woman in her old rags. So they commenced to live again in their old style. The man often went a-fishing, but he never more caught the golden fish. End of chapter 6 The Old Man, His Wife, and the Fish Recording by Phil Casper www.philcasper.net Chapter 7 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. The Golden Mountain. In a certain kingdom there once lived a Tsar and his wife, who had three fine sons. The eldest was called Vasily, the second Fyodor, and the youngest Ivan. One day the Tsar went with his wife to walk in his garden, and there suddenly came on such a storm that the Tsarina was carried off by it, out of her husband's sight. The Tsar was sore grieved and sorrowed for a long time. When the two eldest sons saw their father's trouble, they came to him and asked him to let them go forth to look for their mother. So he gave them his blessing, and they set out. They travelled for a long time, and at last came to a great desert. There they pitched their tent and waited to see if anyone would come to tell them the way. 
For three years they waited, but they saw no one. Meanwhile, the youngest brother, Ivan, went to his father to ask him for his blessing and took leave of him. He travelled for a long time, until at last he saw some tents in the distance. He rode on and, on coming to them, he saw that he had found his brothers. "'Why do you stop on the borders of this dreary waste, brothers?' said he. "'Let us go on together and seek our mother.' The others agreed, and they once more set out. When they had gone a long way, they saw in the distance a palace built of crystal, with a wall around it of the same material. They drew near to it, and Ivan opened the gate and rode into the courtyard. As he approached the door, he saw a pillar to which there were attached two rings, one of gold and the other of silver. He put his bridle through the rings and secured his horse, and then went to the door. There the king of the palace came to meet him. They talked for some time, and the king, discovering that Ivan was his nephew, led him into his room and brought his brothers in also. When they had been with him a long time, the king gave them a magic ball, which the brothers threw before them, and following it they came to a high mountain, at the foot of which they stopped to rest. It was so high and so steep that no one could climb up it. Ivan rode round it to discover some means of getting to the top, and at last he found a crevice, into which he stepped. Then he saw an iron door with an iron ring. When he had opened the door, he found some iron hooks, which he fastened to his hands and feet. By means of these, he contrived to climb to the top of the mountain. When he reached the top, he was very tired, and sat down to rest, and as soon as ever he took off the hooks, they vanished. Afar off in the mountain he saw a tent of fine cambric, on which was pictured a copper kingdom, and on its summit was a copper ball. On going to the tent, he found at the entrance two large lions, which refused to let him pass. Ivan, however, saw two copper basins standing near, so he went and got some water and gave it to the lions, who were thirsty, and then they let him go into the tent. When he had come there, he saw a lovely princess on a couch, and at her feet slept a dreadful dragon whose head Ivan cut off with one blow. The princess thanked him, and gave him a copper egg, in which was contained a copper kingdom. Then the Tsarevich left her and went on. When he had gone a long way, he saw a tent of fine gauze hung from a cedar tree by silver cords. These cords had tassels of emeralds, and on the tent was the picture of a silver kingdom. On the summit of the tent was a silver bowl. At the entrance lay two large tigers. He satisfied their thirst, as he had done that of the lions, and then they let him pass. When he came into the tent he saw a lovely princess dressed in very fine clothes, and very much more beautiful than the former. At her feet lay a dragon with six heads, and twice as large as the first. With one blow Ivan cut off its heads, and the princess rewarded his courage by giving him a silver egg, in which was a silver kingdom. Then Ivan left her and went on. At length he came to a third tent of silk, on which was pictured a golden kingdom, and on its summit was a bowl of pure gold. The tent was hung from a laurel tree by gold cords, 
and the tassels of the cords were composed of diamonds. By the entrance lay two large crocodiles, which breathed out great flames. The Tsarevich gave them some water, and thus got them to let him enter the tent. Inside he found on a couch a princess who even surpassed the two former ones in beauty. At her feet lay a dragon with twelve heads. Ivan cut off all the heads with one blow of his sword, and the princess, thanking him, gave him a golden egg in which was a golden kingdom. With it she also gave him her heart. As they talked together, Ivan asked the princess if she could tell him where he should find his mother, and she, showing him where his mother dwelt, wished he would have good fortune in his adventure. He went on a long way and came to a palace, and going in he passed through many rooms, but he found no one in them. At last he came to a large, beautiful hall, and there he saw his mother, dressed in royal robes, sitting on a chair. When they had tenderly saluted, Ivan told her how he and his brothers had travelled very far to seek her, whom they loved so much. The Tsarina informed Ivan that a spirit would soon come, and told him to conceal himself under her cloak. When the spirit appears, said she, seize his magic wand with both hands. He will then fly upwards with you, but do not be afraid, and be quiet. After a time he will fall to the earth and be dashed to pieces. You must gather these up, burn them, and scatter the ashes on the field. His mother had scarcely finished these words, and hidden him under her cloak, before the spirit appeared. Then Ivan sprang forward as his mother had told him, and laid hold of the magic wand. The spirit seized the Tsarevich, flew with him far up, fell to the ground, and was dashed to pieces. The Tsarevich gathered these together and burnt them, but kept the magic stick. Then he took his mother and the three princesses whom he had rescued, and coming to an oak tree, he let each one of them slide down the mountain side by means of a linen cloth. When the brothers, who waited at the foot of the mountain, saw that he alone remained at the top, they tore the linen cloth out of his hand, led away their mother and the three princesses to their own kingdom, and made them take an oath that they would tell their father that they had been saved by them. Ivan was thus left alone on the mountain, and did not know how he could get down. He walked about very sorrowfully, and happening to pass the magic wand from one hand to the other, a man suddenly appeared before him and said, What is your will, Ivan Tsarevich? Ivan was much astonished to see the man, and asked him who he was, and how he had come on the mountain. "'I am a spirit,' replied the man, "'and was the servant of him whom you have overcome. As you have now his magic stick, and as you have passed it from one hand to the other, as you always must when you want me, I have come to perform what you wish. That is well, said Ivan to the spirit. Do me your first service, then, and carry me into my own country. Scarcely had he finished these words before he found himself in his father's city. He wanted to first know what was going on in the palace, so instead of going straight in, he went and began work in a shoemaker's shop for he thought no one would quickly recognize him there. The next morning the shoemaker went into town to buy some leather, and came home in the evening very drunk. 
so tipsy was he that he could not see to the shop so he left all to his new man ivan knew nothing about the work so he called the spirit to assist him and told him to set to and make some shoes while he himself went to sleep when the master awoke early the next morning he went to see what work his men had done and when he found him still fast asleep he was very angry and said ah you lazy fellow do you think i took you into my service to sleep do not blame me replied ivan stretching himself go first into the workroom and see what you find there the shoemaker went off and how much was he astonished to find there a number of shoes all finished he went to them and took up a shoe to look at the work but he was more astonished still and began to disbelieve his eyes for there was not a single stitch in the shoes but they were all of one piece he took some of the shoes and set off to sell them and every one who saw the wonderful shoes bought them eagerly his fame spread and in a short time the shoemaker became so noted that they sent for him to the palace there he saw the princesses who ordered him to make them some dozens of shoes adding that they must all be ready by the next morning he told them that it was impossible for him to do what they asked but they said that if he did not do what they told him he should have his head cut off for they declared they well knew he made his shoes by some magic means the poor shoemaker left the castle thinking he was as good as a dead man went into the city bought some leather and went a drinking to drive off care towards evening he came home and throwing the leather down upon the floor said to his new man listen you wretched fellow to what you have done with your magic work so he told him all that had happened with the princesses and how he was to be put to death if he did not do what they commanded don't be put out said ivan lie down and go to sleep the morning will bring us good luck his master thanked him for what he said laid himself down on a bench and very quickly began to snore then ivan called upon his spirit ordered him to make all ready and went to sleep himself though the shoemaker had been very drunk when he awoke early in the morning he remembered that he was to have his head cut off that day so he went to his man and said let us have a bottle together so that i may be more courageous when i am under the axe do not fear answered ivan go into your workshop you will find that all is finished and ready to be taken to the palace the shoemaker walked off to the workshop not believing what ivan said but when he saw all the shoes ready he was so delighted that he did not know what to do he embraced ivan and called him his saviour he took the shoes and set off to the palace and when the princesses saw the shoes they felt sure that ivan must be in the town so they said to the shoemaker you have well performed what you were ordered but you must do something more for us this night there must be built opposite our palace a golden castle there must be a porcelain bridge from the one palace to the other and this must be covered with velvet the shoemaker was confounded at this and said i am only a poor shoemaker how can i do such a thing if you do not do what we tell you said the princesses your head shall be cut off the shoemaker went at once from the castle weeping bitterly 
he turned in at an alehouse to drown his care got drunk and when he reached home told ivan what he had been commanded go to sleep said ivan tomorrow will bring us good luck the shoemaker laid himself down on a bench and went to sleep and ivan calling this spirit to him told him to get everything ready as the shoemaker had been commanded after that he lay down and went to sleep also early the next morning ivan woke his master and putting the wing of a goose in his hand said go at once to the bridge and dust it ivan himself went into the golden palace the tsar and his daughters woke very early and came out on the balcony and from there they saw everything the princesses were beside themselves with joy for they were now sure that ivan was in the town and soon after they saw him standing at a window in the golden castle then they begged the tsar and his wife to go with them into the castle and as they were about to go up the steps of the palace ivan came out to meet them his mother and the princesses ran forward to embrace him and said this is he who rescued us his brothers were ashamed and looked down on the ground and the tsar was thunderstruck so astonished was he his wife however soon explained everything to him and then the tsar was so angry with his eldest sons that he would have put them to death ivan threw himself at his feet and said my dear father if you wish to reward me for my labor grant me the lives of my brothers and i shall be satisfied then his father raised him up kissed him and said they are really unworthy of thee so they all went back to the castle the following day three weddings were celebrated the eldest son vasily wedded the princess of the copper kingdom fyodor the second son married the princess of the silver kingdom and ivan saw them settled in their dominions he himself and his princess took possession of the golden kingdom he took the shoemaker with him and there they all lived for many years prosperous and happy End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 8 The Duck That Laid Golden Eggs. There lived once an old man and his wife. The man was called Abrosim, and his wife Fatinia. They were very poor and miserable, and had a son named little Ivan, who was fifteen years old. One day old Abrosim brought a crust of bread home for his wife and son. He had scarcely begun to eat, however, when Kruchina, sorrow, sprang up from behind the stove, seized the crust out of his hand, and ran away behind the stove again. The old man made a bow to Kruchina and begged her to give him the crust back again, as he and his wife had nothing else to eat. "'I will not give you the crust again,' said Kruchina. "'But instead of it I will give you a duck which lays a gold egg every day.' "'Very well,' said Abrosim. "'I shall be supperless to-night. "'Do not deceive me, but tell me where I shall find the duck.' "'Early to-morrow morning,' said Kruchina, "'when you are up, go into the town. "'There you will see a duck in a pond. "'Catch it and carry it home.' When Abrusim heard this, he lay down and went to sleep. The next morning he rose early and went to the town, and was very much pleased to see the duck swimming about on a pond. He called it to him, carried it off to his home, and gave it to his wife, Fatina. They were both delighted, and put the duck in a big basin, placing a sieve over it. In an hour's time they went to look at it, and discovered that the duck had laid a golden egg. Then they took the duck out and let it walk a little on the floor, and the old man taking the egg set off to town. 
There he sold the egg for a hundred roubles, took the money, and going to the market, bought different kinds of vegetables, and set off home. The next day the duck laid another egg like the first, which Abrasim sold in the same manner. So the duck went on laying a golden egg every day, and the old man became in a short time very rich. He bought a large house, a great many shops, all kinds of wares, and set up in business. His wife Fatina made a favorite of a young clerk in her husband's employ, and used to supply him with money. One day, when Abrasim was away from home buying some goods, the clerk called to have a talk with Fatina, and it chanced that he then saw the duck that laid the golden eggs. He was pleased with the bird, and examining it found written under its wing in gold letters, Whoever eats this duck will be a Tsar. He did not say anything to Fatina about what he had seen, but asked her to roast the duck for him. Fatina said she could not kill the duck, for all their fortune depended on it. But the clerk begged her so earnestly that she at last consented and killed it and put it in the oven. The clerk then went off, saying he would return soon, and Fatina went out in the town. When they were gone, in came little Ivan. He felt very hungry, and looking about him for something to eat, he chanced to see the roast duck in the oven. So he took it out and ate all of it but the bones. Then he went off again to the shop. In a little while the clerk came back, and having called Fatina, asked her to bring out the duck. The woman went to the oven, but when she saw that the duck was not there, she was terribly put out, and told the clerk that the duck had disappeared. At that the clerk flew into a great rage, and said, You have eaten the duck yourself, of course, and he got up and walked out of the house. In the evening Abrasim and his son little Ivan came home. When Abrasim did not see the duck, he asked his wife where it was, and she told him that she did not know. Then little Ivan said to his father, My dear father, when I came home in the middle of the day for dinner, my mother was not in. So I looked in the oven, and there found a roast duck. I took it out and ate it all but the bones. But I do not know whether it was our duck, or a strange one. Then old Abrasim was in such a rage that he thrashed his wife till she was half dead, and he turned little Ivan out of doors. Little Ivan began his journey. Where should he go? He determined to follow his nose. For ten days and nights he went on. Then he came to a town, and as he stepped to the gate he saw a great many people assembled together. Now these folks had been taking counsel, their Tsar being dead, as to who should succeed him. In the end they agreed that the first person who came in at the city gate should be made Tsar. Just then in came little Ivan through the gate, so all the people cried out together, Here is our Tsar! The chief folk took little Ivan by the arms, conducted him to the royal apartments, put on him the Tsar's robe, seated him on the throne, made obeisance to him as to their Tsar, and waited for his commands. Then little Ivan thought he must surely be asleep and dreaming all this, but at last he knew that he must really be Tsar. He was heartily pleased, began to rule over the people and to appoint his officers. A short time after he called one of them named Luga to him, and said, my true friend and good night, Luga, I want you to do me a service. Go to my own country, go to the Tsar, salute him from me, and ask him to deliver to you the shopkeeper Abrasim and his wife, so that you may bring them to me. If he will not deliver them up to you, tell him that I will lay waste his country with fire, and will make him himself my prisoner. When the servant Luga was come into little Ivan's country, he went to the Tsar and asked him to let Abrasim and Fatinia go away with him. The Tsar was unwilling to let Abrasim go, for he wanted to keep the rich merchant in his own country. He knew, however, that Ivan's kingdom was very large and populous, and being therefore afraid, he let Abrasim and Fatinia depart. Luga received them from the Tsar, and conducted them to his own native country. When he brought them to little Ivan, the Tsar said to his father, Yes, father, you turned me away from your house, and I therefore bring you to mine. Come. Live with me, you and my mother, till the end of your days. Abrasin and Fatinia rejoiced exceedingly to find that their son was become Tsar, and they lived with him many years until they died. Little Ivan ruled for thirty years in good health and was very happy, and all his people loved him sincerely to the last hour of his life. End of chapter 8 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 9 of Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Folklore and Legends, Russian and Polish, by Charles John Tibbets. Chapter 9 In a certain village there once lived a peasant who had three sons, of whom two were sensible, but the third was a fool, and his name was Emelyan. When the peasant had lived for a long time and was grown very old, he called his three sons to him and said to them, My dear children, I feel that I have not very long to live, so I give you the house and cattle, which you will divide, share, and share alike among you. I also leave you in money a hundred roubles apiece. Soon after, the old man died, and his sons, after they had buried him, lived on happy and contented. Some time after, Emelyan's brothers took into their heads to remove into the city and carry on trade with the three hundred roubles which their father had left them. So they said to Emelyan, Hark ye, fool, we are going to the city, and we will take your hundred roubles with us. And if we prosper in trade, we will buy you a red coat, red boots, and a red cap. Do you, however, stay at home here? and when your sisters-in-law desire you to do anything, do as they bid you. The fool, who had a great longing for a red coat, a red cap, and red boots, answered at once that he would do whatever his sisters-in-law told him. So his brothers went off to the city, and Emelyan stayed at home. One day, when the winter was come and the cold was great, his sisters-in-law told him to go out and fetch in water. But Emelyan remained lying on the stove, and said, Aye, and who then are you? How now, fool? said his sisters-in-law. We are what you see. You know how cold it is, and that it is a man's business to go. I am lazy, replied he. How, cried they, you are lazy? You will want to eat. And how can we cook? if we have no water. Very well, then. We will tell our husbands not to give him anything when they have bought the fine red coat and all for him. The fool heard what they said, and as he was very desirous to get the red coat and cap, he saw that he must go. So he got down from by the stove and began to put on his shoes and stockings and to dress himself. When he was ready, he took the buckets and the axe and went down to the river, which ran near their village. When he arrived there, he cut an enormous hole in the ice. He then drew water in the buckets, and setting them on the ice, he stood by the hole, looking into the water. As he looked, he saw a large pike swimming about in the open water. Fool as Emelyan was, he felt a wish to catch this pike. So he stole on softly and cautiously to the edge of the hole, and making a sudden grasp at the pike, he caught him and pulled him out of the water. Putting him in his bosom, he was hurrying home when the pike cried out, Oh, fool, why have you caught me? To take you home, answered he, to get my sisters-in-law to cook you. Oh, fool, said the pike. Do not take me home, but let me go again into the water, and I will make a rich man of you. Emelyan, however, would not consent, and was going on homewards. When the pike clearly saw that the fool was not inclined to let him go, he said, Hark, ye fool, let me go, and I will do for you everything you do not like to do for yourself. You will only have to wish, and it will be done. When the fool heard that, he rejoiced very much, for as he was uncommonly lazy, he thought to himself, If the pike does everything that I have no mind to do, all will be done without my having any occasion to work. So he said to the pike, I will let you go in the water if you will do all you promise. 
let me go first said the pike and then i will keep my promise the fool however said that the pike must first perform his promise and then he would let him go when the pike saw he would not put him into the water he said if you wish as i told you that i should do all you desire you must tell me now what your desire is i wish said the fool that my buckets should go of themselves from the river up the hill and that without spilling any of the water then said the pike remember the words i now say and listen to what they are at the pike's command and at my request go buckets of yourselves up the hill the fool repeated after him at the pike's command and at my request go buckets of yourselves up the hill instantly with the speed of thought the buckets ran up the hill when emelyan saw that he was amazed beyond expression and he said to the pike but will it always be so everything you desire will be done said the pike but do not forget i say the words i have taught you emelyan then put the pike into the water and followed his buckets home the neighbors were all amazed when they saw the buckets and said to one another this fool makes the buckets come of themselves up the river and he follows them himself at his leisure but emelyan took no notice of them and went on home the buckets were by this time in the house and standing in their place on the foot bench and emelyan himself lay down on the stove after some time his sisters-in-law said to him again emelyan what are you loitering there for get up and cut wood but the fool said i and you who are you then you see cried they it is now winter and if you do not go and cut wood you will be frozen i am lazy said the fool what you are lazy said the sisters-in-law if you do not get up and cleave wood we will tell our husbands not to give you the red coat or the red cap or the fine red boots the fool who longed for the red cap coat and boots saw that he must cleave the wood but as it was bitter cold and he did not like to leave the stove he repeated under his breath as he lay there at the pike's command and at my request up axe and hew the wood and do you logs come of yourselves into the house and lay yourselves in the stove the axe instantly jumped up ran into the yard and began to cut up the wood and the logs came of themselves into the house and went and laid themselves in the stove when the sisters-in-law saw this they wondered exceedingly and as the axe did the work of itself whenever emelyan was wanted to cut up wood he lived with them for some time in great tranquillity at length the wood was cut and they said to him emelyan we have no more wood so you must go to the forest to cut some i said the fool and you who are you then the wood said the sisters-in-law is far off and it is winter and too cold for us to go i am lazy said the fool how you are lazy said they you will be frozen then and besides when our husbands come home we will tell them not to give you the red coat cap and boots as the fool longed for the red clothes he found that he must go and cut the wood so he got off the stove and began to put on his shoes and stockings and to dress himself when he was dressed he went out into the yard pulled the sledge out of the shed took a rope and axe with him mounted the sledge and called out to his sisters-in-law open the gate when the sisters-in-law saw that he was going off in the sledge without any horses for the fool had not put the horses to it they cried out 
why emelyan you have got on the sledge without yoking the horses he answered that he did not want any horses but asked them to open the gate the sisters-in-law threw open the gate and the fool as he sat in the sledge said at the pike's command and at my request away sledge go to the wood at these words the sledge galloped out of the yard at such a rate that the people of the village when they saw it were filled with amazement the sledge went on so very fast that if a pair of horses had been yoked to it they could not have drawn it at anything like the same rate as it was necessary for the fool to go through the town on his way to the wood he came to it at full speed not knowing that he should cry out make way in order that he might not run over any one he gave no notice but rode on so he ran over a great many people and though they ran after him no one was able to overtake him and bring him back emelyan having got clear of the town came to the wood and stopped his sledge he then got down and said at the pike's command and at my request up axe hew wood and you logs lay yourselves on the sledge and tie yourselves together the fool had scarcely uttered these words when the axe began to cut wood the logs to lay themselves in the sledge and the rope to tie them down when the axe had cut wood enough he desired it to cut him a good cudgel and when the axe had done this he mounted the sledge and said up and away at the pike's command and at my request go home sledge away went the sledge at the top of its speed when emelyan came to the town where he had hurt so many people he found a crowd waiting to catch him and as soon as he got into the town they laid hold of him and began to drag him off his sledge and to beat him when the fool saw how they were treating him he said under his breath at the pike's command and at my request up cudgel and thrash them instantly the cudgel began to lay about it in all directions and when the people were all driven away he made his escape and came to his own village the cudgel having thrashed them all soundly rolled to the house after him and emelyan as usual when he got home lay down on the stove after he had left the town the people began everywhere to talk not about the number of persons whom he had injured but about the amazing fact of his riding in the sledge without horses and from one to another the news spread till it reached the court and came even to the ears of the king when the king heard the story he felt an extreme desire to see emelyan so he dispatched an officer with a party of soldiers in search of him the officer whom the king sent lost no time in leaving the town and he took the road that the fool had taken when he came to the village where emelyan lived he summoned before him the starosta headman of the village and said to him i am sent by the king to take a certain fool and bring him before his majesty the starosta at once showed him the house where emelyan lived and the officer entering it asked where the fool was emelyan who was lying on the stove made answer and said what is it you want with me how said the officer what do i want with you get up and dress yourself i must take you to the king what to do asked emelyan the officer was so enraged at the rudeness of his replies that he gave him a slap on the cheek at the pike's command and at my request said the fool under his breath up cudgel and thrash them at the word up sprang the cudgel and began to lay about it on all sides on officer and on men alike the officer was forced to go back to town as fast as he could and when he came before the king and told him how the fool had cudgeled them all round the king marvelled greatly and would not believe that he had been able to cudgel them at all the king then selected a wise man commanding him to bring him the fool by craft if nothing else would do 
the envoy left the king and went to the village where emelyan lived he called the starosta before him and said i am sent by the king to take your fool so do you send for those with whom he lives the starosta then ran and fetched the sisters-in-law the king's messenger asked them what it was the fool liked and they answered noble sir if any one entreats our fool earnestly to do anything he flatly refuses the first and the second time the third time however he does not refuse but does what one wants for he does not like to be roughly handled the king's messenger then dismissed them charging them not to tell emelyan that he had summoned them before him he then bought raisins baked plums and grapes and went to the fool when he came into the room he went up to the stove and said emelyan why are you lying there and with that he gave him the raisins baked plums and grapes and said emelyan we will go together to the king i will take you with me i am very warm here said the fool for there was nothing he was so fond of as warmth the messenger then began to entreat him be so good emelyan said he let us go you will like the court vastly i said the fool i am lazy the messenger began once more to entreat him be so good said he come with me and the king will get you made a fine red coat a red cap and a pair of red boots when the fool heard the red coat mentioned he said go on before i will follow the messenger then pressed him no further but went out and asked the sisters-in-law if there was any danger of the fool's deceiving him they assured him that there was not and he went his way the fool who was still lying on the stove then said to himself how i hate this going to the king then after a few minutes thought at the pike's command and at my request said he up stove and away to the town instantly the wall of the room opened and the stove moved out when it had got clear of the yard it went at such a rate that there was no overtaking it and it came up with the king's messenger and went after him and entered the palace with him when the king knew the fool had come he went forth with all his ministers to see him and when he saw that emelyan was come riding on the stove he was greatly amazed emelyan still lay where he was and said nothing then the king asked him why he had hurt so many people when he went to the wood it was their own fault said the fool why did they not get out of the way just at that moment the king's daughter came to the window and looked at the fool and emelyan happening suddenly to look up at the window where she stood observing him and seeing that she was very handsome said quite softly to himself at the pike's command and at my request let this lovely maiden fall in love with me scarcely had he spoken the words when the king's daughter was desperately in love with him he then said at the pike's command and at my request up and away stove go home immediately the stove left the palace went through the town got home and set itself in its old place there emelyan lived for some time comfortable and happy other people in the town however were far otherwise at the word of emelyan the king's daughter had fallen in love with him and she began to implore her father to give her the fool for a husband the king was in a great rage both with her and the fool but he knew not how he could lay hold of him his minister however suggested that he should again send the officer whom he had before sent to take him this advice pleased the king well and he had the officer called to him when he came the king said hark ye friend I sent you before for the fool, and you came without him. To punish you, I now send you for him a second time. If you bring him, you shall be rewarded, but if you do not bring him, you shall be punished. When the officer heard that, 
he left the king and lost no time in going in quest of the fool when he came to the village he called for the starosta and said to him here is money for you buy everything for a good dinner tomorrow invite emelyan and when he comes make him drink till he falls asleep the starosta knowing that the officer came from the king felt obliged to obey him so he bought everything that was required and invited the fool when emelyan said he would come the officer was greatly pleased so next day the fool came to dinner and the starosta plied him so well with drink that he fell fast asleep as soon as the officer saw he was asleep he laid hold of him and ordered a carriage to be brought when it came they put the fool in it and the officer getting in himself drove off to the town and so to the palace the minister informed the king that the officer had come and as soon as he heard it he ordered a large cask to be provided without delay and to be hooped with strong iron hoops when the cask was brought to the king and he saw that everything had been done as he desired he ordered his daughter and the fool to be put into it and the cask to be well pitched when all this had been done the king ordered the cask to be thrown into the sea and left to the mercy of the waves the king then returned to his palace and the cask floated along for some time on the sea all this time the fool was fast asleep when he awoke and found it was quite dark he said to himself where am i for he thought he was all alone but the princess said you are in a cask emelyan and i am shut up with you in it but who are you asked he i am the king's daughter answered the princess and then she told him why she had been shut up there with him she then besought him to deliver himself and her out of the cask but the fool said i am very warm here grant me the favor said the princess have pity on my tears and deliver me out of this cask why said emelyan i am lazy the princess began once more to entreat him grant me the favor emelyan said she deliver me out of this cask and let me not die the fool was moved by her tears and entreaties and said well i will do this for you he then said softly at the pike's command and at my request cast us o sea on the shore where we may dwell on a dry place only let us be near our own country and do thou cask fall to pieces on the dry land scarcely had the fool spoken the words when the waves began to roll and the cask was thrown up on a dry place and fell to pieces of itself emelyan got up and went with the princess about the place where they were cast the fool saw that they were in a very fine island where there was an abundance of trees with all kinds of fruit on them when the princess saw that she rejoiced greatly at their being on such an island and she said but emelyan where shall we live there is not even a nook here you want too much said the fool grant me the favor said the princess let there be if nothing more a little cottage in which we may shelter us from the rain for the princess knew he could do anything he wished i am lazy said the fool the princess began again to urge him and emelyan overcome by her entreaties was obliged to do as she desired he went away from her and said at the pike's command and at my request let me have in the middle of this island a finer castle than the king's and let a crystal bridge lead from my castle to the royal palace and let there be people of all conditions in the court the words were scarcely spoken then there appeared a splendid castle with a crystal bridge the fool went with the princess into the castle and saw that the apartments were all magnificently furnished and that there were many people there such as footmen and all kinds of officers who waited for the fool's commands 
when he saw that all these men were like men and that he alone was ugly and stupid he wished to be better so he said at the pike's command and at my request let me become such a youth that i shall have no equal and let me be extremely wise he had scarcely spoken the words before he became so handsome and so wise that all were amazed emelyan then sent one of his servants to the king to invite him and all his ministers to the castle the servant went along the bridge which the fool had made and when he came to the court the ministers brought him before the king and emelyan's messenger said please your majesty i am sent by my master to ask you to dinner the king asked him who his master was but he answered please your majesty i can tell you nothing about my master but if you come to dine with him he will inform you himself the king who was curious to know who it was who had sent to invite him told the messenger that he would come without fail the servant went away and when he got home the king and his ministers set out along the crystal bridge to visit the fool when they arrived at the castle emelyan came forth to meet the king took him by the white hands kissed him on the mouth led him into his castle and made him sit behind the oak tables with fine diapered tablecloths at sugar meats and honey drinks the king and his ministers ate and drank and made themselves merry when they got up from table and retired the fool said to the king does your majesty know who i am as emelyan was now dressed in fine clothes and was very handsome it was not possible to recognize him so the king said that he did not know him then said the fool does your majesty recollect how a fool came on a stove to your court and how you fastened him up in a pitched cask with your daughter and cast them into the sea know me then now for i am that emelyan when the king saw him thus before him he was greatly terrified and knew not what to do but the fool went to the king's daughter and brought her out to him when the king saw her he was very pleased and said i have been very unjust towards you so i give you my daughter for your wife hearing that emelyan thanked the king and when he had prepared everything for the wedding it was celebrated with great magnificence and the following day emelyan gave a feast to the ministers and to the common people there were barrels of wine set forth and when all these festivities were at an end the king wanted to give up his kingdom to him but emelyan had no mind to take it so the king went back to his kingdom and emelyan remained in his castle and lived happily end of chapter nine Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.